All right. Hello, everyone. Um, so I am Mary Towner. Um, I'm the uh, first year GYN Oncology Fellow at Northwestern. Um, and I would like to introduce, although you've already met her this morning, Dr. Emily Hinchcliffe. Um, she is going to be um, heading up this breakout session on endometrial cancer. Um, so Dr. Hinchcliffe, as you probably heard this morning, she's one of our attending GYN oncologists. Um, she works at um, the main Northwestern Hospital as well as Lake Forest. Um, and she is going to be talking primarily about immunotherapy in endometrial cancer. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to just put them in the chat. You can also direct message me if you want it to remain anonymous, and I'll make sure that it still gets asked. All right, Dr. Hinchcliffe. All right, so let me start sharing my screen. Um, please let me know if that, obviously my face is going to be sort of awkwardly on the side here, but, um, let me know, does that look right? Can we see everything? Okay. All right. Great. Um, so hello everyone. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to you all today. Um, as you just heard, I am Emily Hinchcliffe. I am one of the GYN oncologists who just joined the faculty here at Northwestern. Um, Dr. Alter and unfortunately Nancy both had unexpected conflicts this morning. So you are going to be hearing a lot from me. Um, I will be presenting both of their portions of the session, um, but certainly please ask questions in the chat and I will try and get to as many as we can at the end of the session. So um, here is the outline for our session today. Um, I'll be starting with some general information about genetic testing to really help clarify what your doctor means when they talk about it and the different testing options. Um, then I'll go over how this testing may impact the treatment of endometrial cancer. Um, we'll be focusing specifically on immunotherapy during the session today. I'll explain how it works um, and some of the trials that led to the recent FDA approvals. Um, then we all kind of shift gears and um, go through some of the side effects that are specifically important to watch out for with immunotherapy. Um, and then to close, we'll talk more generally about clinical trials, what they are, what to expect. Um, and we'll conclude with a quick plug for a non-therapeutic study that some of you may already be involved in. So to get started, um, when talking about mutations and genetic testing, the central thing to understand is really the difference between what a somatic mutation and a germline mutation really is. Um, germline mutations occur in egg or sperm, which means that they can be heritable since all of these cells are inherited in the child. Somatic mutations are mutations that in, are in non-germline tissues, such as in the tumor itself. Um, so germline testing helps to determine if there is a genetic condition that runs in your family and can be passed to, on to children. Um, often these conditions, or sometimes called syndromes, can have risk of other cancer types as well. So there may be screening or prevention strategies that could be important to prevent cancer in you or your family. Conversely, somatic testing assesses what is abnormal in the tumor itself. Um, the best metaphor that I can come up with is that the tumor is sort of like base camp, um, and it relies on kind of multiple different supply pathways or chains for nutrients, for growth, for oxygen. Um, and if the tumor is dependent on a specific mutation, i.e. dependent on one of those specific supply chains, and there's a drug that works to cut off that supply chain, um, that tumor may be uniquely sensitive to that drug. So that's what we call targeted therapy. Um, and so somatic mutation can therefore impact what targeted therapy may be good for you. Um, they can impact prognosis and they can also impact the immunogenicity of the tumor. And we'll talk a lot more about that later in this session. So um, one of the types of mutations that we'll be talking about is mismatch repair. This is a somatic test, i.e. in the tumor itself, that looks for mutations in four different genes. They're listed here. Um, MMR or mismatch repair, so that if when I say MMR, that's what I'm referring to, um, deficiencies occur in about 20 to 40% of endometrial cancers. Um, and a subset of those MMR deficiencies are associated with Lynch syndrome, which is the heritable form of MMR deficiency. 
So to quickly talk about this, this is probably a little bit small for you all to see, um, but there is a sort of algorithm that we use to determine if your tumor shows defects in this MMR pathway, um, are you someone who it's just in the tumor or are you at risk for having the familial syndrome, the Lynch syndrome um, form of those defects? And that's the germline and heritable form. The other type of testing that your doctor may have talked to you about um, is something called next generation sequencing. This is also somatic testing on the tumor itself. Um, and what it does is it uses a commercial panel to look for mutations in multiple genes at once. Um, this can be done on prior surgical biopsies. Um, you may not need a new biopsy to have this done um, and is often sent at the time that a cancer recurs or comes back rather than at initial diagnosis. Um, this is because, oops, sorry if that's cut off at the bottom. Um, this is because the significance of this full panel of mutations may often be unclear, um, but that sometimes this panel may offer new options or potential clinical trials or experimental treatments that you may be eligible for. Um, there, this is just kind of the logos. There are many different panel tests and some have kind of unique features. Myriad was first to the game um, and they're my choice testing is the companion diagnostic used for many trials in gynecologic oncology. So they are often what's considered to be the gold standard. Um, just to bring out some of the others, Garden 360 offers a liquid biopsy, uh, meaning they can contain tumor information um, from blood samples. While Tempest um, is sort of like the Google of these tests, it's unique in that it pairs tumor mutation um, with clinical uh, information to try and help um, guide treatment. Um, importantly, just globally, they all accomplish the same goal, which is to test a panel of mutations in a patient's tumor um, and try and guide future therapy. A quick word on germline testing, um, specifically for endometrial cancer, um, one of the most common things that we'll be looking for is this Lynch syndrome that I already brought up. Um, that's the heritable form of these MMR defects. Um, so germline testing um, is often done on blood or saliva up until 2013. So I'm just going to kind of switch over. Similarly, these are some of the types of tests that your doctor may recommend. So until 2013, Myriad again held a patent on these genes, specifically the BRCA genes. Then in a landmark decision, um, it was determined that legally a company cannot patent a gene. So there are now many companies that perform germline testing. Each has their own panel of mutations, and these panels may vary slightly within the specific genes, but generally they test for genes that we know to be heritable. So BRCA is one of the common ones you may have heard of, or these Lynch syndrome genes um, specific to endometrial cancer. So to turn kind of to the main focus, let's delve a little bit into endometrial cancer. Why do we care about these genes? Um, and what is the clinical relevance? So it all comes down to what we call precision medicine. This is the goal of tailoring treatments to best treat each patient's individual cancer based on those mutational changes. Um, the hope is that we find new treatments that may be better able to treat cancer or may have kind of less toxic side effects um, or avoid ineffective medications. I think it's important to mention that this is still a work in progress. And it's one of the reasons that we talk about clinical trials in a session like this. So um, it is not yet useful for all patients, um, but they, there are currently kind of several different classes of treatments. For patients with BRCA or BRCA-like mutations, um, they have been shown that their tumors respond well to a class of drugs called PARP inhibitors. Um, and that's being talked in much more detail in the ovarian cancer session today. Um, certainly targeted therapies to specific mutations are coming down the pipeline. Um, and there's a whole breadth of that that I will not be speaking on. Um, but the last class of drugs that we will be focusing on is for immunogenic tumors that may respond to immunotherapy. Um, importantly, just to give you guys a global sense, 
Efforts to examine these sort of genetic drivers have shown that anywhere from 60 to 90% of patients will have at least one therapeutically actionable mutation, meaning a mutation that there's a drug that may impact treatment, um, either that is already FDA approved or is in trials. And of the patients who were treated with one of those targeted mutation or targeted therapies, um, about 40 to 60% derived clinical benefit, just to give you guys some numbers for what this may look like for you. So let's delve a little bit further into kind of immunogenicity um, that are potentially targetable with immunotherapy. So there are several different types of defects in your tumor that may, um, potentially make you eligible for immunotherapy. And specifically with immunotherapy, um, we're going to be talking about a class of drugs called immune checkpoint inhibitors. But first I think it's too important to talk about what makes an immunogenic tumor. So um, at its core, the immune system is built to respond to abnormal things. It's why it responds to infections um, such as bacteria or viruses. So tumors are inherently immunogenic meaning that the immune system should be attacking your tumor at all times. However, tumors find a way to kind of cloak themselves using receptors on their surface. These receptor pairs between the tumor and the immune system um, sort of put blinders on the immune system so that it doesn't rec recognize the tumor as something abnormal to attack. Um, these receptors are what's called immune checkpoints. They have separate names, but the ones you'll hear about are PD-1, PD-L1, that's that pair, and then the other is CTLA-4. So if a tumor is cloaking itself with these checkpoints, the reason that immunotherapy works is it takes the blinders off. It blocks the tumor blockade. Um, and so it revs up the immune system so the immune system can attack the tumor with new force. Um, some of the names of these drugs are listed below. You may hear these referred to, so pembrolizumab referred to as Pembro, nivolumab referred to as Nevo, Dostarlimab, others of these drugs that are kind of coming down the pipeline. Importantly, by kind of revving up the immune system, um, these drugs may cause the immune system to rev up against other things, against normal tissue that it shouldn't attack. Um, and that's why some of the immune, so, sort of the immune system side effects and these side effects from these checkpoint agents can be different than what you may have experienced on other chemotherapy. And we'll certainly talk more about that later in the session. Um, so um, next, um, Immunohistochemical studies, meaning studies of the tumor itself, have kind of tried to describe what the levels of PD-1, PD-L1 is in endometrial cancer. And as you can see, the percentages are pretty high. In the most common type, in endometrioid endometrial cancer, about 40 to 80 percent of these tumors will express PDL1, um, slightly lower in serous, and again, slightly lower in clear cell subtypes, respectively. However, um, studies that have trialed immunotherapy based purely on PDL1 status, meaning taking women only based on does, do, does their tumor express PDL1 and treating them with single agent checkpoint blockade, um, the efficacy of that is really modest. Um, early studies of pembrolizumab in PDL1 positive advanced tumors. Um, for those with endometrial cancer, the response rates were only about kind of 13% in terms of partial response and an additional 13% with stable disease. So modest benefit if we base only on PDL1 status alone. So if the PDL1 receptor is not a perfect marker of who should get immunotherapy, what are some other options? Um, a second way to determine the immunogenicity of a tumor is to look at the tumor mutation burden. Um, this is a graph of the mutation burden, meaning how common are mutations? How um, heavily mutated is the tumor type? Um, and I have boxed the GYN tumor specifically in red with the blue arrow pointing out uterine tumors specifically. The way this works is that increased mutations, marked with red stars here, lead to abnormal proteins on cells. These proteins then cause there to be more and more abnormalities on the tumor surface, meaning more reason that the immune system should sort of recognize the tumor as abnormal and attack. Okay. 
The last defect, which we already talked about specifically in the kind of testing that your doctor may be doing on your tumor, is defects that may um, that are called mismatch repair deficiency. This is also referred to as microsatellite instability. So you may, I will refer to these as MMR and MSI in the rest of the session. So apologies if I kind of flip back and forth between those um, words. But what this means is that in a normal cell, there are sort of areas of repeats within the DNA, and these are translated into proteins using a complex known as MMR, um, and they translate the DNA successfully. Okay, it's a little bit counterintuitive because good translation, meaning successful of sort of correct translation, results in tumor survival, which is bad. We do not want the tumors to survive, obviously. Okay, so when a tumor is MMR deficient, it means that those proteins are not working properly. Okay, and there's increased slip at that area. And so the translation doesn't happen properly, which again means more abnormal proteins and more abnormal proteins lead to more abnormal things being on the surface of the cell, lead to the tumor looking more abnormal to the immune system, okay? Um, and therefore, that means that this would be a good tumor to target with immunotherapy, the checkpoint inhibitors. Um, so. It's important to note that in endometrial cancer, endometrial cancer is actually the tumor type that has the highest prevalence of microsatellite instability across 30 different cancer types that they tested. About 30% of primary endometrial cancer, meaning at diagnosis, um, are found to be MSI high. And 13 to 30%, so slightly less, um, but at recurrence, are found to be MSI high or MMR deficient. Okay, so if I've been telling you that these tumors are supposed to respond to checkpoint inhibitors, let's look at some of the data. So this is Keynote 158. It was a trial of multiple different tumor types, all with MSI high or MMR deficiency within the tumor. Um, about 50 of these two uh, women, or about, sorry, 50 of these patients had were women with endometrial cancer, and they were all treated with single agent pembrolizumab, so one of those checkpoint inhibitors. They reported a pretty impressive response rate of about 57%. What you see at the top here is sort of the duration of response, and at the bottom you see a graph of the percent change, so of the tumor size, so going down means the tumor is getting smaller, um, and how much smaller did that tumor get? Um, so as you see, the response rate here was about 57%. And in this trial, they described a phenomenon where women treated with checkpoint inhibitors, if you have a response, it may be a prolonged response. Unlike traditional chemotherapy, which the benefit stops when you stop the chemotherapy, the immune system sticks around. It's something that's inherently in your body at all times. So there's emerging data that the benefit to immune checkpoint, if you get benefit, may result in kind of these prolonged responses over a longer period of time, okay? Subsequent studies, I think it's important to mention, with a different checkpoint inhibitor, Dostarlimab, have described a similar efficacy. Again, around 40% had a complete response or partial response to um, single agent checkpoint. And for a vast majority, upwards of 90% of those women, the response lasted for six months or more. Okay. So this trial and five other similar multi-cohort trials resulted in the first ever tumor agnostic FDA approval. It's my favorite FDA approval of all time. Um, and what that means is that it didn't matter where the tumor started from or what kind of tumor it was, if it has that MMR deficient or MSI high phenotype, meaning if the tumor looks like that um, with those deficiencies, you can treat it with single agent pembrolizumab, okay? In endometrial cancer specifically, we have two drugs, two single agent checkpoints that we can use. Pembro, first to, to kind of the end point here and probably more common, or Dostarlimab. Um, and those are the two drugs that are currently approved. So the big follow-up question to that is, but what happens if my tumor isn't MSI high? What do I do if I'm in that 70% of women when my tumor's first diagnosed or even more than that when my tumor comes back? Um, and so now we treat, there's an option to use immunotherapy in combination with a drug called lenvatinib 
or lymphema. And what lymphatinib is, um, is that tumors rely on various signaling targets. And I've kind of depicted this, apologies for my very kindergarten level uh, use of PowerPoint, but tumors rely on various signaling pathways, right? So whether that's to gain blood vessels, to get oxygen, to gain nutrients, or to suppress the immune system, there's these cell signaling pathways that the tumors use to grow and stay alive. Um, and lenvatinib um, inhibits some of those signaling pathways and may also combat the immunosuppression oppressive environment that a tumor creates around itself. So um, this study, uh, Keynote 775, was a randomized trial of these two agents, and it included women with both MMR deficient, so the patients that we were talking about before, as well as MMR proficient, so patients who have tumors that do not have that kind of defect in their mismatch repair. Um, and what they showed is that this is a graph, again, reporting the kind of change in tumor size from baseline. And as you can see here, the blue bars are women that had proficient tumors. They didn't have that MSI high MMR phenotype. Um, and this trial showed that there was benefit even without that defect. Um, and so there was also benefit independent of PD-1, PD-L1 status that's marked as those little pluses, minuses, and zeros on the um, top line right here. I don't know if you can see my mouse. Um, so this showed that there was benefit in combination for these women. Um, I also think it's important to bring out that this trial included a lot of different um, histiologic subtypes. So it wasn't just your standard endometrioid. It also included women with serous or clear cell, and there were responses seen in those women as well. Okay. So um, kind of before I get to the take home messages, I think it's important to talk about what else is coming down the pipeline. This may be data that you guys already know, um, the stuff that I've presented before or data that your doctors have talked to you about. But I think the next step, what's kind of the next horizon of immunotherapy and endometrial cancer? I think first, we're trying as a field to combine immunotherapy with chemotherapy because they're different classes of drugs the side effect profiles are different. So often they can be used together really well. Um, and so I've just listed some of the trials. This is by no means a comprehensive list, but this is some of the trials that we have ongoing that include sort of your traditional chemotherapy, carboplatin, paclitaxel, combined with pembrolizumab for endometrial cancer, um, or dostarlamab or atezo, depending on which trial you may um, have heard about. The second thing that we're doing is we're trying to see, can we move these drugs earlier in the treatment? So not just when the tumor recurs and when women have already received chemotherapy, but should we be treating with Lenpem or Lindatinib Pembro sooner? Um, and so we're comparing it against chemotherapy. Does the side effect profile differ? Do women do better when they get immunotherapy earlier in their treatment course? Um, and I don't think we know that yet, but that's something that we're studying. And the last kind of ever expanding field is similar to lenvatinib and pembrolizumab, which is a combination of therapies. Can we combine immunotherapy with other things to make either it more effective or to make it effective in a group of women who it wasn't effective for before. So that can include combinations with PARP inhibitors, combinations with other drugs that inhibit those cell signaling pathways. And there are so many of those, it would be impossible to talk about all of them in one of these sessions. Um, and then also the combination of radiation. We're not really talking about radiation in detail today, um, but there's some data that radiation in itself causes the tumors to look more abnormal to the immune system. So even if you radiate kind of one tumor, there may be an impact with immunotherapy on all of the tumors around the body. So there's a lot of, um, there's studies looking at the combination of immunotherapy and radiation, both in the upfront and in the recurrent setting. Um, so just so that you guys are aware, Northwestern has these trials open for you, um, both in the recurrent and upfront space. So um, it's something that you wanna talk to your doctor about to see if you are eligible for any of those trials. So now just to kind of summarize before we move on, um, Immunotherapy is an entirely new class of drugs with anti-cancer activity. It has a different mechanism from traditional chemotherapy. Um, and so 
while it is sort of specifically and especially beneficial in immunogenic tumors, we can use combination therapy like Lenpem, Lindatinib Pembro, to treat what are considered to be non-immunogenic tumors. And then importantly, those women who have responses, we may be seeing that they have much more sort of longer duration of remissions because the immune system sticks around um, and can impact the tumor longer term. Similarly, um, it's important to say that the toxicity profile is really different from these drugs. So I think now let's take a little breather. I feel like I've been talking for a little while, um, but we are going, I was gonna turn it over to Nancy, but hang on, let me switch to Nancy's um, slides. Give you all a second. Um, does that look right? You guys can see the slide view? Okay. Yeah, that looks great. And how are we doing on time? Good, okay. Good, yeah. Well, I'm just gonna keep looking at you and you can tell me to hurry up if I need to. Um, okay, so side effect profile and management. I'm gonna talk about lindatinib and Pembro as a combination, um, but the side effects that I talk about for Pembro apply to all of the checkpoints inhibitors and apply to um, those of you who may be sort of receiving Pembrolizumab by itself rather than in combination, okay? Um, so right now, as I mentioned, this is shifting and we're studying, can we use this combination in different women? But right now, for women who either haven't seen chemo or have had a long duration, meaning a lot of time since they last were treated with chemotherapy, um, we still recommend for endometrial cancer that those women be treated with chemotherapy first, okay? However, for women who have either progressed on chemotherapy or who they just got off their chemo and their cancer has come back, we feel that maybe it's better to be treated with Lenpem at that time. So those are the people who right now we are recommending Lenpem. Um, if your tumor has one of those MSI high or MMR deficiency phenotypes, um, it may be that your doctor recommends Pembro alone because we think your tumor will respond to Pembro without needing the Lenvatinib, okay? Um, so this we sort of already talked about, I can skip through that. Um, just to go through some of the dosing, just so you guys are aware, lenvatinib is an oral pill. Uh, many of you may not have had the opportunity to be on an oral chemotherapy, uh, but this is a pill, dose has changed, but 14 to 20 milligrams by mouth daily. Um, and um, while you're taking this pill, I think it's, it's important to know that just because it's a pill doesn't mean it's not chemotherapy. I think a lot of women are like, oh, I'm just taking this medicine, same as I take my blood pressure medicine. It's still chemo and it still has side effects. So it's really important to monitor while you're on lindatinib. And so what we do um, is we monitor weekly labs, usually for the first two, one to two cycles um, while your body is adjusting to the medication. Um, Pembro is an IV medicine um, given every three weeks. There is six week dosing, um, but it's important to kind of talk to your doctor about whether you should be on the three week or the six week. And um, we will often start women on three week because it means that you're coming in to see us more frequently and we can monitor you more closely, okay? Um, so yeah, again, this is, sorry, I'm just adjusting to Nancy's slides. So um, this just talks a little bit about kind of how generally the management of these chemo agents may be done. Um, Lenvima, uh, first thing, kind of our first line of attack if you're having a side effect is to hold it for a week. Have you stopped taking the pill? When you're on the any of the oral chemotherapies, it's really important that you keep track of when your last dose was because your doctors will constantly ask you like, when was your last pill? When did the side effects start? And we really need to know the nuances of when you stop the medicine. Um, then we will always kind of repeat labs, your liver function, your blood counts, your renal, your kidney function. Um, especially if you're having a side effect, we may increase the frequency of those lab draws. Um, and then with Lenvima, in addition to managing your symptoms, we may drop the dose um, from whatever you started on. If you started on 14, we may drop it to 10. If you started on 20, we may drop it to 14, okay? Conversely, Pembro, we don't dose reduce. We actually just hold the medication. Um, so you will just not get your infusion as scheduled based on that kind of three week timeline. Um, importantly with immune side effects, steroids are 
commonly used for severe cases um, because what steroids do are they decrease the inflammation. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second when we talk about Pembrolizumab side effects. Um, and then certainly if it's really severe or you required hospitalization, your doctor may tell you to just stop the Pembro altogether. So what are the side effects kind of to watch out for with each of these drugs? Let's start with linvatinib. Um, so the common side effect that we see with linvatinib are things like high blood pressure, fatigue, diarrhea, joint muscle pain. You can read this list for yourself. Um, I do think it's important to bring out the last one on this slide, wound healing may be impacted by linvatinib. So if you're about to have a procedure, your doctor may recommend stopping this therapy. Um, and certainly if you're on the pill, remember to sort of be in touch with your doctor about when exactly you're supposed to top, stop the pill with regards to any future procedure you might be having. Um, similarly, when should you restart it after such a procedure as well? Um, more rarely, linvatinib can impact the thyroid, it can impact your heart rhythm, cause blood clots, um, or cause issues with the bones of the jaw. Um, just because hypertension is so common, up to 64% of women can actually experience this when taking linvatinib. Um, I think it's important to bring it out and talk about what we do about it. Um, the first step in management is to ensure that your blood pressure is under good control before you start. Um, so making sure that your blood pressure medicines are optimized, talking with your PCP before you then start the drug. Um, we monitor the blood pressure really closely, especially during that kind of first week, then every two weeks for the first two months, um, and monthly thereafter. We will ask you um, often to check your own blood pressure at home, because um, you can certainly keep a closer eye on it than we can, um, and call us if there's something that you notice is kind of slowly creeping up. Um, we may modify or discontinue this the Lenvima if you do have blood pressure issues. And we will work with your primary care doctor or your cardiologist, whoever's managing the blood pressure medicines to try and optimize um, your regimen to make sure that we can, if possible, keep you on the medicine. Um, similarly, hypothyroid can be something that we deal with um, with Lenvima. Um, we monitor a blood test called TSH, your thyroid stimulating hormone that tells us how your thyroid is functioning. Um, you may be required to start a thyroid replacement medication if the labs show that your thyroid isn't working properly. And as with hypertension, your doctor may hold, decrease the dose, or stop if the thyroid levels become severe. So now let's talk about the other drug, the pembrolizumab, but basically any of the checkpoint inhibitors, the starlimab as well. So the reason that um, these drugs have these side effects is that when you take the blinders off the immune system and rev it up, it certainly revs up against your tumor, but it also can rev up against normal tissue. And that causes this kind of inflammatory or immune related side effect that are kind of called the itises. So colitis, which is an inflammation of the bowel or pneumonitis, which is an inflammation of the lungs. Um, hepatitis, an inflammation of the liver, all of these itises can be side effects with immunotherapy. Um, and I think they're important to talk about because they can be really severe. Um, more generally, again, um, fatigue can be common with checkpoint inhibitors as well. Um, and so that's something that you should continue to bring up with your doctor. You can have allergic reactions to either of these drugs um, that we will monitor for when you're getting your infusion. So let's talk about some of the common itises. Um, and then certainly if you guys have any unique or specific side effect questions, I can, we can bring those out in the chat later. Um, so the first, let's talk about colitis. So the symptom that you should be monitoring is diarrhea. Unlike on traditional chemotherapy, when if you call in with a bit of diarrhea, I might give you a kind of medicine to help you get your stools to be a little bit more formed and not really worry about it. With immunotherapy, um, this can be very severe and even life-threatening. Um, the things that you should watch out for are the frequency. So how many times a day are you having to go to the restroom? That's one of the questions that your doctor or your um, care team is going to ask you. And then second, if you do call in, it's important to be sure that the provider you're speaking with knows that you're on an immunotherapy. If you just say, I have diarrhea, they may not know that if you're speaking to one of the call team. So making sure that you know that you need to bring that out, okay? Um, the management of this, similarly, sort of we monitor, then manage, then potentially permanently discontinue. So um, we may have you hold the medicine. We may try and give you some medicines to help 
stop the, the diarrhea, but if it doesn't improve after usually about a couple days, five days or so, um, you may be given steroids to try and dampen that immune response. And some women may even require hospitalization um, based on the severity, or if you kind of keep getting these diarrhea episodes after we give you the immune checkpoint, your doctor may have to stop treatment entirely. The second side effect that I think it's really important to um, bring out is pneumonitis, because this can be a kind of vague symptom. The, this is kind of inflammation of the lungs and the symptoms are new or worsening cough, kind of shortness of breath. It can go along with that fatigue and it may be hard to tease out what's fatigue and what's really shortness of breath, um, especially with, you know, in times of COVID, these symptoms are important to take seriously no matter what, um, but with immune checkpoint, have a lower threshold to call with any of those symptoms and knowing when to present to care is important. So again, your doctor may hold the dose. Um, they may give you steroids or discontinue the drug based on that duration of how long and severity. Um, with pneumonitis, it's not uncommon, especially if your symptoms are severe, that you may need a on a CAT scan to look at the inflammation of the lung. And then sometimes as we're monitoring you getting better after we've stopped the therapy, you may need kind of frequent chest x-rays or other imaging studies to make sure that that inflammation is going down. Um, next, oh, these I won't go too far into. Um, these are just sort of the most standard GI side effects that we see on lenvatinib Pembro. Um, I leave them here because these slides will be posted. And so these are some of the things that you can do in terms of diet or other medications um, if you're experiencing these side effects. So I leave them here mostly so that you can refer back to them on the um, uh, online site once they're posted. Um, so this again is just a summary. It's an option for women who do not have those specific MMR defects. Um, and it does, you know, we have shown that it improves survival for these women. All right, I think that's it. So hang on, give me a second. Let me move back to the other slideshow. I also, let me just take a drink of my coffee. I apologize. I've been talking for a while, okay. Um, let's, now I wanted to take a second again, we're, how are we doing on time? Still okay? All right. This session ends at one. Uh, let's give you like five more minutes till okay. two minutes I will, questions, if that's okay. Yes, absolutely. So I, questions. Yeah. So this is a really general overview. I think in any of these sessions, one of the questions that I think I get asked a lot in clinic, but in any of these kind of bigger forums, it's important to talk about clinical trials because I think it's something that is, there's a little bit of mystery surrounding it. Um, and so we wanna try and make it easier to understand. So um, what a trial is, there is the purpose of a trial is to um, research treatments or interventions um, that are they safe and uh, effective in humans? And to determine what medical approach may be best for a particular patient group or disease. Um, they give us the best data to support our healthcare making decisions. Um, and it's important to emphasize that these studies are research, so they have to follow sort of very strict research guidelines and scientific standards. Um, they're both interventional and observational, and I just want to bring that out a little bit. Interventional trials test an intervention, so a drug, a device, a test or procedure. There are potential risks to that intervention, um, and then there are potential benefits, and an informed consent process goes through those risks and benefits. Conversely, observational trials collect data or tissue that's sort of already going to be collected within your standard of care. It may include additional questionnaires or surveys. So generally speaking, they tend to be low risk, but they may have minimal benefit to you instead having benefit for those who follow you. They may lead to new ideas or impact the care of um, a disease sort of moving forward. Um, to quickly go through the trial phases, I'm not going to belabor these in detail, um, but phase one trial is something that's being tested in humans for the first time. So the goal is to determine dosing. What is the tolerable dose? Toxicity, efficacy are not known, um, and so it is high risk with unknown benefit. Generally speaking, phase one trials, we think that most of them have a response rate of less than 10%. Usually these trials are open to many cancer types um, because we're looking to really determine the safety in humans. 
phase two studies, the dose and toxicity are already known. They were already established in one of those phase one trials. So the goal is to test efficacy in a certain po um, patient population. The risk is smaller and the benefit is potentially higher because usually phase two, um, the patients that are selected are because there was some signal in a phase one trial. Um, Generally, all patients in a phase two trial do receive that trial drug, um, and these studies often acquire sort of additional testing, whether that's biopsies, blood tests, things like that. So it can be more time intensive, um, and usually there are very strict enrollment criteria as to who is eligible to enroll in the trial. Phase three, um, dose and toxicity are known. Efficacy in a disease site was established in one of those phase two trials. So this is really the definitive proof prior to an FDA approval of a drug. Often phase three trials are randomized, meaning some participants will receive the investigational agent and some participants will receive a control. Now our control group doesn't always mean that you're not getting anything or you're getting the placebo. What it may be is that you're receiving what is kind of considered to be the standard of care and what the phase three trial is doing is trying to compare, is this new intervention better than the standard of care or equivalent to the standard of care? And then phase four, um, the dose toxicity efficacy are already established, FDA approval is granted, um, and this is just post-approval observation to make sure there aren't any safety signals or efficacy signals long-term. Um, are these for you? Um, I think as physicians, we feel that clinical trials are our best data. It's how we make decisions. For patients, it provides access to new drugs that may not be available otherwise. There is the potential benefit, but it's unknown in many of the cases. Really, and the biggest benefit is that it advances knowledge and it can provide these future patients with access to novel therapies. Risks, sort of risks and cons, the potential toxicities, there is that potential lack of benefit. Like I said, many times it's unknown. Um, and there is a time commitment, additional testing um, above and beyond the standard of care. Lastly, I think you may have seen in some of the breakouts, we do have one of these more observational studies going on that I just wanted to bring out. Some of you may actually already be involved in this study. Mostly I bring it up because the breast cancer patients are beating us in terms of enrollment. So we really wanna get as many women with endometrial cancer involved. Um, so what we know is that physical activity is associated with enhanced quality of life and potentially prognosis in both breast and endometrial cancer survivors. However, up to 70% of these women do not engage in the amount of activity as recommended by the American, American Cancer Society. So the perfect of, purpose of the My Activity study is to kind of promote that activity through um, an intervention using Fitbit. Um, and so what this does is participants are provided a Fitbit that actually links directly with your MyChart, um, your electronic health record. You receive feedback, your doctor team receives feedback, the study team receives feedback, and it's done in sort of two phases. Phase one is that six month initial period where you're getting used to it, you're trying to increase your activity. And then phase two is sort of a longer maintenance period. Are you able to keep up that activity? And what is it like for you in, a, in the long term? Um, so I think it's a really great study. It provides you with information and um, it provides obviously us as a field with information. So if you're interested in participating, um, the email is at the bottom and um, please feel free to contact the study coordinators or talk with your doctor about it and we can get you in touch if it's something that you're interested in. So whew, that was a lot. Um, I am going to stop sharing. Hopefully now you see Nicole's face nice and big and um, we can get you. I have not been monitoring the chat at all. So all right. Mary, who's going to Mary. Yeah, Mary's gonna take over for that. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Hinchcliffe. That was amazing. All right. Um, so I'm going to start with our first question, which is, um, do you know anything about and can you talk about the impact testing that is done at Memorial Sloan Kettering? Yeah, absolutely. So many institutions will have an institutional sort of panel. So like, remember when I talked about the next generation sequencing and that there are these sort of commercial companies that do panel testing. So impact is Sloan Kettering's panel test. Um, and it's something that sort of is a overlap, but each of those different companies or each of those institutions may have slightly different testing done. So that's what impact is. Um, and so if you're 
for example, going to Sloan Kettering, if you've already had next gen sequencing done, they may not want to do that because again, the overlap is pretty significant. But if you haven't had next gen sequencing done and you're seeking a second opinion, for example, at recurrence, that may be something that they recommend. Oh, you're muted. Sorry, sorry, I was muted. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Um, let's see. Another question um, is: Do you know which type of um, PDL one test they do? I'm assuming that this question is like referring to here at Northwestern. Um, there's the PDL one two two three C test, and they're wondering if that's what they use here at Northwestern. Um, good question, actually. So PDL1 testing is what's called an immunohistochemical test. So what that means is that the pathologists look at your tumor and they stain it to see what the receptor level is, like how much receptor does your tumor express, i.e. how much suppression is the tumor providing to the immune system. I will be honest that I don't know exactly which IHC marker our pathologists use here. Um, there are only a sort of subset of approved um, kind of clinical tests that qualify as PDL1 tests. So I would suspect that that particular one that you're speaking of is one of those approved tests. Um, and I also did not know, but I, I just looked up in our pathology, one of our pathology reports, um, and they use apparently the SP263 clone instead of this other one. So thank um, you, Mary. Insider info. Um, okay, next question is um, about the My Activity study. Mm -hmm. um, wondering if you can participate in it if you are one and a half years from the end of your treatment. Oh, good question. Um, I think probably the best thing to do would be to reach out to the investigators. I don't know if they have an outer limit um, for when they say people are eligible. I think it's survivors generally, but I'll be honest, I don't know the specifics. So I would reach out to them for sure. All right. Okay. Um, so another question. Um, let's see. So um, I'm a patient receiving um, Len or lymphema pembrolizumab. Um, my dose of lymphema has been reduced um, from low, due to low platelets. Um, so how is this going to impact my response to treatment or my toxicity response? Yeah, that's a great question. So we are still kind of studying, lymphatin and pembro is a very new combination. And so we as a field are still studying what the impact of that is. However, there have been kind of retrospective studies, meaning studies looking at women who were treated with LENPEM, um, and they seem to show that the efficacy rates, even with dose reduction, don't seem to change. So if your doctor has to reduce the dose of lenvatinib because you're having, you know, blood pressure issues or whatever it is, it seems like you may still derive benefit. Certainly there's probably like a lower threshold where you know, if your dose has to keep being reduced and keep being reduced, but we don't really know where that lower threshold is. So that's something that your doctor will probably talk to you about in terms of balancing the risk of ongoing side effect with the potential that you may still be deriving benefit. Wonderful. All right. Um, all right. Another question. Uh, my doctor ordered genetic testing and I have a variant of unknown significance. What does that mean? Yeah, so this is one of the biggest um, struggles that we have with next-gen sequencing. Um, there are very often either what are called variants of unknown significance or mutations in genes that we don't sort of have drugs that target yet. So what you'll get when you get next-gen sequencing is you'll get sort of a big panel report and it will say that you have either mutations or variants of unknown significance. So let's talk briefly about that first. So a mutation is a defect in that particular gene that we know what the cause, sort of what the downstream effect is. So there may be a functional effect of that mutation. A variant of unknown significance is when there's a, there's a defect, there's a mutation in that gene, but we don't know if that mutation causes any downstream impact in terms of function. So it may mean that even though there's a defect in that gene, the drug that targets that gene may not be a good fit for you. We just don't know. Okay. Um, and then the second thing, um, oh, sorry, I lost my train of thought there. So the second thing is you'll get a full panel. So there's also the possibility that you get a 
panel where there's a defect in a gene, but that gene, we don't have a drug that targets that pathway. We don't know that that is targetable. So it's certainly good information to have because new drugs and new targets and new combinations are always coming down the pipeline. And it may be that you would be eligible for a clinical trial of one of those drugs based on that mutation. But it, it may mean that right now there's nothing that we have that can specifically target your mutation. Wonderful. All right. Um, oh, another good question. Can you explain what high or low copy numbers mean? Yes. So this has to do with like tumor mutation burden, right? And so um, is your tumor kind of more immunogenic or less immunogenic? Um, and so that's kind of what we think about. The nuances there, I think, are probably sort of unnecessary to talk about, I'll be honest. Um, but it's, a, it's another way that we try and assess how good would your tumor be um, treated with immunotherapy. All right, fabulous. Let's see, um, I already had genetic testing done. Should I have genetic testing done again? Yeah, so that's a great question. So like I mentioned before, um, oftentimes, so when you first get diagnosed with endometrial cancer, we will send your tumor somatic testing for the MMR genes, that deficiency that we were talking about that makes your tumor more susceptible. If you have certain defects and certain um, abnormalities in those genes, we may also send for germline testing to see if you have that hereditary form, Lynch syndrome. That's done upfront at kind of the diagnosis. Genetic testing, like the next generation sequencing that we're talking about, that is often reserved for at time of recurrence. Like I mentioned, that doesn't necessarily mean that you need to get a new biopsy, um, but it's often done when there's recurrence because the reason we do it is to try and see if there's other eligible options. Like would a patient at that time be eligible for any of these clinical trials or newer agents? So if you've already had genetic testing done, it is probably not, your tumor doesn't seem like it changes that much throughout the treatment course. However, we are still studying exactly how often tumors will, you know, have a mutation and then do what we call revert, meaning that mutation will kind of go away as the tumor grows over time or vice versa. Your tumor didn't have a mutation in the first place, but then over time it kind of develops different mutations. And so there's a lot of work being done to figure out how often we should be doing these tests. But right now, classically speaking, if you've had it done that's usually what we'll only, we'll do, we'll do it once. Just to add on to that, like if you're unsure whether or not you're, you've had genetic testing, whether it's tumor or germline, please reach out to your care team um, so that they can provide you with the, uh, the information um, that is necessary. And for some reason, if it has not been done, uh, we'll make sure that it gets done immediately. Wonderful. Thank you both. Um, let's see. Um, chemo treatments always leave me feeling short of breath and very wiped out. Um, since I'm on Limpim, how will I know when symptoms are bad enough that I need to call my doctor? Yeah, I think um, the Limpim symptoms and immunotherapy symptoms in general can be really vague. Um, but as I mentioned, I think they can, you know, we know that they can be life-threatening if they get severe. So I think the biggest things to watch out for are certainly keeping a low threshold to call your doctor. Um, and it's more about trend. So if you have a symptom and it kind of starts to get better, it starts to go away, I think that's a thing that we wouldn't worry as much about. But if you have a symptom and it's getting worse, even as you get sort of further away from therapy, um, that's when I would call your doctor. Um, I think Nicole just mentioned, yes, when in doubt, my chart message, my chart message, my chart message. Absolutely. We really have a great team here. Um, and so there's always someone who's checking those and can reach out and kind of help you titrate, like how worrisome is your symptom? Um, what things should you watch out for? What things can you try? Um, so I think that's probably the best uh, response I can give is just, if you're worried, send us a message. And I also think if you're leaving the infusion suite and you're feeling short of breath, definitely tell your infusion team. Um, and if, you know, they'll assess you appropriately, uh, but then they'll let the clinic team know. And that way we can check up on you in the next day or the next couple of days. Oh, and one more thing that's good to think about with immunotherapy. 
unlike chemo, where there's sort of a very clear timeline of when we expect certain symptoms, right? So you get your infusion and we expect an allergic reaction either like during the infusion or shortly thereafter, right? Like those symptoms are much more predictable. Immunotherapy has a much less predictable timeline. So even if it's been, you know, you stopped your Pembro for some reason, and now you're a couple weeks later and you haven't had therapy for a little while, you could still be at risk for one of those side effects. So I think it's important once you've had immunotherapy, like I said before, to really communicate that with your providers um, and make sure they're aware, make sure you're kind of having that lower level of suspicion. Wonderful. Thank you both. Um, are there any other questions? Let's see. All right, Nicole, do we, we're going to get automatically kicked out of this, right? Yes, we'll get automatically kicked out. But if we're done and no one else has any additional questions, uh, you can leave the room. Don't leave the session, but leave the room and you can head back to any virtual exhibits if you like, or take a quick break, get a snack. Um, and then we will have uh, the closing remarks uh, shortly thereafter. Okay. Wonderful. And if anyone thinks of any other questions, they can still send me a message and um, Dara is going to put all this up on the website. So if there's a question we didn't get an get it get to, we can always like get the answer and post it on the website later. So feel free to send me a message if something pops up. All right. Thanks, Dr. Hinchcliffe. Thanks, Nicole. All right, guys, it was so nice to kind of virtually meet you all. I'm sure I will see many of you around the clinic. Um, I hope that this was helpful. And certainly if you think of questions afterwards or if you have particular um, comments about either how to make this forum better or more useful to you, um, I'm really glad we were able to have an endometrial cancer session this year. Um, certainly let us know. We are always looking for um, responses from you guys as patients to how we can make this mo the most beneficial um, for you guys. So it's very nice to meet you all and glad we could have the session this year. Oh yeah, okay. Um, so I do see a question in the chat that I can try and answer in like the whatever 30 seconds that we have left. Um, so P53 is a very common mutation in um, ovarian cancer actually, but it's also relatively common in uterine serous cancer. Unfortunately, there are not easy drugs that target that, um, but what you may have heard about what's kind of coming down the pipeline is we may be kind of categorizing risk based on tumor mutations in endometrial cancer rather than based on pathology. Um, so women who have that P53 mutation um, may sort of have a higher risk based on it looking like a serous cancer. Um, I think that P53 is like the holy grail of something that we really want to be able to target but haven't figured out how because it's so common in many cancer types, ovarian, uterine serous, and many other cancer types, but there's no good drug right now that seems to be able to target it effectively. All right, guys, thank you so much for hanging here. Um, I will, it looks like we have about a minute, 60 seconds left. Um, so let's head back to the main session.